Welcome to the topic of vector field visualization. Today I'm going to focus on computational algorithm for flow lines. Visualizing flow lines is the most fundamental flow visualization technique. The output is similar to what people used to see in the experimental flow visualization. There are several types of flow lines, depends on how you place the initial particle position and also whether the data field is static or time varying field including string line, path line, streak line, and time line. They will look exactly the same if your underlying data is a static field, that is, there's only one time step. And sometimes people also call this instantaneous flow lines. String line is a line that is tangential to the instantaneous flow direction. In other words, if you take a string line as a space curve, you compute tension at a given point, the tension vector is, is exactly the same as the velocity vector. The way you compute a string line is to release a particle in your domain and then perform numerical integration to compute the trajectory of the particle. Pass line has very similar concept as a string line, except that it is a trajectory of a particle moving in a time varying field. In other words, the vector direction and the magnitude will change as the particle moves. In the traditional experimental visualization, this path line is collected by taking a time exposure photo for fluid particle. So it is a motion history of the particle, as opposed to be something you can see at any instant in time. Streak line is a collection of points connected together. Essentially, imagine you have a fixed location, you continue to inject a particle, and particle will move forward, but at a fixed time interval, when you come to a new instant, you release another particle, and then particle go. So you can imagine, suppose you divide your time into discrete instants of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. At every integer instant, you release a new particle. Particles that have been introduced are going to move forward. Then if you connect all the particles that you have created at time step 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all together, you're going to form a streak line. Experimentally, people would produce streak line by continuously injecting an ink into the field and uh, the ink that has been introduced into the field is going to form a line pattern, and this is called streak line. One thing to note is in a steady flow field, that is the vector direction do not change over time, streamline, pass line, and the streak lines are identical. For unsteady flow field, they are different. The degree of difference depends on how the flow changes over time. Timeline has a slightly different concept. To generate timeline, you will first of all select a row of particles as the initial position, and those particles form a wavefront. And then you simultaneously move the particle along the row together. Then you always connect the front of the particle, and the wavefront give you a timeline. So here are three examples of flow line computing from the same data set. The upper left have string lines, and uh, the upper right are streak lines. So you can see that initially, from the age of the object, they look similar. However, as the flow becomes more turbulent, those particles start to disperse, and they do, they do not necessarily always form a nice patterns of lines. Image at the bottom show timelines. We start from a row of particle to form a wavefront. Then we update the particle position at a fixed time interval. Those wavefront tells you how the flow change the velocity and direction in the domain. Now let's focus on the algorithm for computing flow lines. And this is done through so-called particle tracing. You start a particle in an initial position, and then based on the flow direction, you compute the next position for the particle in a sequence. We can describe the position of particle in a differential equation. Assuming the velocity field is available everywhere in the domain, described as V or PT. P is a point position, and T is the current time for the particle. P is the position for the particle along the flow line, so the derivative of P dP dt is exactly the velocity. That is how much P is going to travel within a small time interval. This is static field because the velocity V only depends on the position of P, but not depends on the time. For unsteady field, the differential equation is very similar. The definition of unsteady field is that the velocity v is going to be different, depends on which time you are looking at. So the function v now has another independent variable t. 
those two are so-called ordinary differential equation. And remember, our goal is to find out the position of p. In other words, we are trying to solve the function p from this differential equation. And we can rewrite this as a integral. Look at the bottom of the slide. This means the next position, p of t plus delta t, equals to the previous position, p, plus v times small time interval. You can divide this t to the delta t into many, many small time interval, and then perform v times delta t, and sum all the different together. That will be used to update the previous particle position and compute the new particle position. And this essentially requires we solve a numerical integration, that is this term. So let's uh, briefly overview numerical integration, the basic concept. Assume you have function v of t, then to compute the integral of v dt is essentially to calculate the area below the function curve vt. To solve this numerically, what we can do is to divide this function curve v of t into many, many small pieces, and then calculate the area underneath of those pieces using different methods, for example, trapezoid approximation. So this reduces a integral problem into a sum of many small area. The error of this numerical integration depends on how fine you divide the function into many small pieces. Obviously, the smaller pieces you divide the function into, the more accurate the result going to be. However, the computation becomes more expensive. Below, we are going to describe a few popular numerical integration methods used for particle tracing. The first method is Euler's method. This is a simple method and uh, can be very easy to implement. The way we compute the next position for the particle p k plus 1 is equal to the previous particle position p k plus the velocity at the p k that is in the previous position times delta t. And remember, when you use a smaller delta t, you can get more accurate results at the cost of a computation. Now, the small figure on the right shows that this because this is numerical integration, so it is only an approximation as you go forward, the trace computed from this Euler's method can deviate from the red ground truth. And this equation can be derived from Taylor expansion. The first term of Taylor expansion is the new function value of t plus h. The function is the particle position is equal to the previous particle position or a function value nearby at t0 plus the step size h multiply the derivative function y, that is y prime, and this equal to our vector direction at vk. And as you know, there are infinite number of terms in Taylor expansion, but when you use Euler's method, you only consider the first two terms, and you discard all the rest. And if you remember Taylor theorem, it says the error is proportional to h squared, where h is the step size, as you can see because you discard many turns, so the error can be quite large. So typically, this is not a method recommended due to its larger error. So now let's look at a more accurate method, that is second order Monocada integration method. In this method, basically, you are going to take an intermediate step and using the vector there plus the vector in the previous particle position together to predict the next particle position. Let's look at the equation. Here, first of all, from the pk, I'm going to add a v times delta t to get the intermediate position. This is essentially the earlier method I just showed in the previous slide. I denote this new point as p star. And then I'm going to look up the vector at the p star. I will take the average of the intermediate position, p star, with the previous particle position, v of pk, divided by 2, that is the average. Then I use that vector to multiply our step size delta t. And this distance is going to be used to update the current particle position pk and result in the new particle position. Because we are taking one additional intermediate step and look up the vector, we are going to be able to obtain a better accuracy. Second order Ronkada method can also be derived from Taylor series. I'm not going to go through this slide turn by turn. However, I give the equations here, and then I'm hoping that you can pause and follow the derivation and then relate what we computed in the previous slide. 
the main difference here is that in second order run Akata, when you look at tail expansion, we consider one additional turn that take the second derivative into account. In the earlier method, we only take into account the first derivative. Now we are consider the second derivative. And then if you carefully go through the derivation, you're going to realize that we are updating the particle position consider the vector at the previous particle plus the vector at the intermediate position particle p star. And the result will give us a more accurate prediction of the particle in the next time step. Now let's look at even more accurate integration scheme that is fourth order Runge-Kata method or RK4. Compared to the second order Runge-Kata method, this fourth order consider four intermediate particle position shown as ABCD turn here. And the new particle position is computed from updating the previous particle position with this four intermediate computation. So I'm not going to um, prove or derive this method here, but again, this equation can be derived from head expansion by considering up to four turns. This is the method typically used for visualizing vector field due to its higher accuracy. So now let's describe the overall algorithm for computing flow lines. You can use different numerical integration method, but the algorithm will look all the same. The first step is to specify a C position at t equals zero. And then you want to know where the C is, that is which cell contains the C. And then because the chances that the C is not at, at any grid point, so you need to interpolate the vector field from the corners of the cell to calculate the vector at this position P. And then you advance the particle to the next step using our numerical method. From the new particle position, you go back to step two and again, identify the cell that contains this current particle interpolate the velocity at the particle, and then apply the numerical method to move the particle to the next position. Something to note is the accuracy of particle tracing depends highly on the step size and also the integration method. Remember, wrong card, the fourth order method is recommended. Because the flow server that produce data often have second order accuracy, you should use at least third order or higher integration scheme. So the Wrong card fourth order satisfy this requirement. For time varying data, you need to remember the velocity for a given particle position need to be interpolated, not just from the cell and also from between two consecutive time steps. And this interpolation can introduce error. Okay, so this concludes our lecture on numerical integration scheme for particle tracing.